These seminars, of course, are made possible through the support of our um, partners, in this case, uh, it's New Zealand Treasury, we have Statistics New Zealand, also ECA, and the Forest Protection. Just before we start, a little bit of housekeeping again, uh, in case the fire alarm starts, just here outside the main entrance, round to the left, and the small room next to the city to city bridge, and in case an earthquake just got cover and hold, and uh, do. So today our seminar is on water insecurity. And water insecurity is one of the greatest threats to humanity in this century for us. Apparently by 2030, more than half the world's population will be in a situation of water scarcity, um, given the current climate change scenarios. And so that being the case, it's really we understand um, the contribution of climate change to what's uh, this here in New Zealand. So how can we plan for resilience to water security and, and save yeah, our most precious resources? Today we're lucky enough to have Peter Graft in presenting and he's going to speak to resilience in response to water and security. And also I think he's going to be highlighting some of the socio um, ecological drivers um, of water resilience and um, how they can be applied. Um, Quentin Rafton, he is a uh, professor of economics, he's also the chair at the UNESCO Water Economics and Cross, cross Boundary Governments at the Australian National University. Uh, Quentin was previously uh, the uh, chief economist. At and the foundation of the Australian Bureau for Resource and Energy in the Hamas. After a presentation by Quentin, it's going to come by the Zoom, we're going to hear the main panel, it's going to be here in the gallery, we've got Christian Zammert here and Judith and other guys, and we've got uh, Susan Green Park coming in from the United States as well. So I'd like to thank you all for making the effort to be along today and the pieces of Thanks for the introduction. Can everybody hear me? Because I, I can't see, I can just see some empty chairs. So you let me know if you cannot hear me, please. We can hear okay, you all right. Good. Good, thank you. Thanks so much for the opportunity, Ruth, and everyone at Motor Trust to, for allowing me to, to present to you today. I wish I could be there in person. The plan was for me to be in there in person, but of course, uh, COVID has got in the way with our plans, along with many other plans in the world. Uh, so first of all, let me just um, let's situate where I am. I'm speaking to you from uh, Canberra, Australian Capital Territory in Australia. And that is the uh, country of the uh, Ngunnawal and the Ngambri people. And I pay my respects to them. Uh, they never ceded their country. And I pay my respects to their elders, past, present, uh, and emerging. So as Ruth uh, pointed out, uh, this presentation I'm about to give you is focusing on our water, uh, fresh water, and the issues around security. In this case, it's focusing in on availability rather than quality issues. And, and I fully understand that water quality issues uh, are a big deal in, in New Zealand. So my focus is really on an Australian issue, which is really around water volumes or water quantity and the implications associated with uh, long-term change in the weather or climate change, if we, if we wish, because um, it's not so clear when it comes to precipitation, whether these are trends or uh, long-term trends or whether they're associated with climate change. And we'll get into some of that details soon enough. And then, of course, the implications of that in the context of a particular case study that I'm referring to. And then uh, what do we do about it? In other words, you know, are there other approaches that are available to us to, to respond, and to adapt uh, to those, uh, those situations? So that's what I'm going to do next. And I'm going to have to um, go and share my screen.
and so hopefully everyone can see the screen if you can't uh, just yell out <laughs> so it should be visible to all of you okay so i'm assuming that it's it is visible so i i also want to thank uh, my co-authors so there's several of us involved uh, long chu i did much of the modeling with me uh, richard kingsford and gilad bino they work in the context of uh, water birds and freshwater ecology in Australia and, and, uh, and also internationally. And uh, my colleague and friend, uh, John Williams, uh, who is a soil scientist and hydrologist. So all of us got together to, to put our combined skills to, to try and look at this, what we think is an important problem from Australia's perspective, but I think it's an important problem in other locations in the world that uh, are, we were considered to be arid or, or semi-arid. And so, um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk through four, four key parts to the presentation. First part is to just give some sense of what we mean by uh, resilience. And as we've pointed out, socio-ecological uh, resilience has particular ways of being defined. And uh, there's many, many, many definitions of uh, resilience. But I'm going to talk to what we consider, uh, we determine to, to be resilience and how we operationalize it in the context of water bird abundance in our particular case study. I'm also going to give you an overview of the, the water story, I suppose, in the Murray-Darling Basin. There's a lot to say about it, so I can only give you a sort of a brief, brief review about what we think is happening, but it's relevant to be able to understand the, the sort of mitigation and adaptation methods that need to be put into place. And then the, 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 the third part of the presentation is really looking at water bird abundance. We, we have also done um, work in the context of um, species diversity, and uh, that's not presented today, but we've also done work in that context as well. And the resilience to what? Well, the resilience is to droughts. And uh, we would define those as hydrological droughts in the sense that there is insufficient water for particular purposes. And those hydrological droughts could be meteorologically related or they could be affected by human activity. It could be both or combination thereof. And that's part of what we are seeking to do in this, this study. And then at the very end, we're going to provide some key findings. And then of course, there's an opportunity for Q&A and there's an opportunity for the panel members to engage with the work as well. So I think it's a very good setup here at uh, Motu Trust. And so it's a good opportunity for, for me to present on behalf of uh, myself and of course, my co-authors. So this is probably familiar to a lot of you in the audience, and this is the issue of resilience. And what we're doing is we're defining the, 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 the words that, um, that uh, Buzz or C.S. Holling has, has used. So it's the capacity of a system. So we're highlighting that in bold font, capacity of a system. We can talk through what that system is to absorb a disturbance or a shock. So something that's, uh, that's an unexpected perhaps, and then to reorganize whilst undergoing change. So it's still the same, uh, retain the same function, structure, identity, and feedbacks. That's a big call to be able to go back in some sense or bounce back, but that's the, that's the definition that's, that's out there. And uh, I'm now about to give you a figure of how to operationalize this notion of a system this notion of resilience. And the way we operationalize it, we provide uh, three different ways of thinking about resilience. And there are three different ways of measuring resilience. So you can quantitatively measure resilience. It's not just a, a concept. It's not, a, not just a qualitative view of the world, although that's helpful. And you can see that in that diagram from Panicky, the, the book uh, by Gunderson and, and Holling himself. Uh, but it is more than just simply uh, a way of thinking. There are ways to measure resilience. And, and so let me just go and go to the next slide, which gives you some sense about how you might be able to measure resilience. So this figure actually has a lot in it. So <laughs> let's, let's take it step by step. So the horizontal axis is time. So something is going to happen at a certain point in time. And the certain point in time that we're going to highlight is, is the time T0. So I presume you can see my cursor going up and down. That's where T0 is. So that's horizontal axis. Something happens at T0. On the vertical axis, we have some measure of system performance. 
So that could be, depending on the system what we're talking about, if it's a fishery, it could be about the, the fishery population or in terms of what we're talking about in this presentation, we're talking about water bird abundance. So some measure of system performance would be some measures of water bird abundance. So, and there are ways that you can measure that um, and the way it's done in our particular study is through aerial surveys and these surveys have been done by Richard Kingsford, one of my co-authors for the past 38 years. And he goes out and does that every October. So let's have a look at these, um, these ups and downs, these fluctuations. Well, these just represent fluctuations in system performance. So we don't have a straight line to indicate that the system is some, in some static world. It's the idea that the system is subject to, to change, <clears throat> but stays within some some overall boundary. So you see the system performance going up and down. It could be seasonal effects. It could be whatever, depending on what system we're talking about. But the point about it is it's staying within some, some boundary. <clears throat> so, um, and then what we find, and this is what this figure is showing, is that at T0, there is some adverse event. Now that adverse event could be uh, oil spillage if we're talking about a fish population, or in our case that we're talking about, it could be a drought. In other words, uh, inflows, stream flows into the into wetlands starts to decline and, and sometimes can die, decline rapidly. And then there's implications for system performance. Let's say it's defined by water bird abundance. And so <clears throat> we go off the green line, so to speak, that's been bouncing around and we drop. <clears throat> and so we've got ways of measuring that drop. And one way to measure it is this idea of resistance. So resistance is the idea of how much and the percentage terms have you dropped from where you were in the previous state before the drought or this adverse event happened. And you can measure it by K relative to where you were at previously, which is uh, at some uh, neighborhood of around M. So that's one way of measuring uh, resilience. And, uh, and then another way of measuring it is recovery time. So the event happens and then um, it presumably happens for a period of time and then goes away, or let's say a drought happens for a year or two, and then normal or above normal uh, stream flows happen, then you recover, the system starts to recover, and you go back and how long it takes to recover to get to the neighborhood where you were previously is recovery time. So that's a second measure of resilience. And then the third measure, which we're not going to use, so I won't uh, I won't go through it with you today, is this idea of robustness. And the robustness is a probability measure in terms of whether you stay within a, a state that uh, does uh, that avoids you going into uh, crossing some, some sort of uh, threshold, which uh, could be uh, uh, something that you can't ever recover from. So what we have here are the green lines, which are the state where we don't have that adverse event. And then we have this amber, orange, whatever that yellow, <laughs> not so good with colors, um, situation where you do get a, a reduction in system performance, but you see that there is a bounce back. It does actually bounce back eventually to get back to where you previously were. And so the, the K, the change in K, you know, the, 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 the perceptual change associated with K relative to M and the recovery time represents um, your um, two measures of uh, resilience. There is an alternative, um, which uh, we, we, we may be heading towards uh, in a number of dimensions in our, in our world, but um, the, other, uh, the other alternative, which is that uh, rather than the yellow or the, uh, the amber space, we actually go into this red curve. The shock is sufficiently large enough that we never recover. We never go back to the neighborhood of where we previously were. And we're in some state uh, where the system continues, but the system performance is uh, very much lower than it was prior to that adverse event. And uh, if anyone who's uh, been reading the, the details of the IPCC's last assessment that came out uh, in the last two days, uh, you can certainly look at the technical summary and among other documents there to, see that uh, there'll be lots of um, uh, situations if we cross those thresholds and there'll be multiple different sorts of thresholds in different locations where we may never recover. And uh, so there are lots of, uh, lots of actions required to, to ensure that we do avoid those, uh, those adverse events if we can and if we are able to adapt uh, and, do, and, and so do so.
So, so that gives a, a sense of, of how we measure resilience. So this is quantitative measures of, of, of how to do that. <clears throat> and now I'm gonna go in and, and talk about the, the Murray-Darling Basin. And, and please forgive me if you're, you are familiar with the Murray-Darling Basin. I, I know a number of you in the audience will be, but uh, I can't assume that everyone is. So I'm gonna have to go through and give some detail. If you feel you are interested in, in knowing more about what's going on in the Murray-Darling Basin, at least the political economy and some of the issues, I can recommend a book. It's not my book. I'm not selling you my book. So, but there's a book that came out earlier this year. It was written by a senior counsel who was part of the uh, Royal Commission on the Murray-Darling Basin that reported to the South Australian government in January of 2019. So he was uh, part of the, that investigation, that Royal Commission, and he's subsequently written a popular book is how I describe it. It's not an academic book, but it does have the facts and, and details in a very funny way written up. If you can believe it, it's a funny way. It's a, uh, he has a style that I would never be able to uh, emulate. But so if you want to know more about what's going on, uh, this is a book that was published in 2021. And uh, it, was published by Richard Beasley, uh, senior counsel. So that's uh, that's that's a story. If you want to follow up on the on the story, and it's a it's a very big story. There's lots of stuff that I could talk to you for hours about in terms of what's going on in the basin. But that's uh, I can only focus on a very small part of that story tonight or today, I should say. So I think it's always helpful when we when we talk about issues or talk about case studies. It's it's very helpful to get a geographical. Uh, sense of what where we're talking about, as well as the when, as, as well as the why, and the what, of course. So here's in the top left corner is the map of Australia. And in red, you see the Murray-Darling Basin, which uh, encompasses parts of, um, of, of Queensland, most of New South Wales, uh, the northern part of Victoria, and the southern part of South Australia. You don't see in that map the Australian Capital Territory, which is about here, uh, which is fully uh, in the Murray-Darling Basin. So it's, it's got multiple jurisdictions and uh, it is uh, managed by these multiple uh, uh, jurisdictions as well as the federal government of Australia. So um, there's a whole set of issues around uh, uh, getting good performance across different jurisdictions because water, of course, doesn't respect boundaries. It, uh, it does flow eventually. And uh, so there's a whole set of issues around that. You can read Richard Beasley's book, I recommend it to you. Uh, I won't focus on that, focus on that. I'll just give you a sense of the geography. So the geography is that they uh, typically, we separate the basin, which is over a million square kilometers. So it's, it's, it's bigger than most nations in the world. Um, we separate into the northern and the southern basins. So we'll be focusing in on the northern basin. Okay, so much of the irrigation uh, volume anyway takes place in the southern basin uh, through the Murray River. And you can see here with these irrigation districts, there's lots of irrigation districts in the southern basin. And you can also see that there are major headwater dams. Okay, so there are multiple dams, Dartmouth and Hume are the two largest and they're in the southern basin. And this is uh, an area where you're catching the water, um, the upper, upper part of the catchments. And then you have uh, the Murrumbidgee River, uh, which flows eventually into the Murray River. And then that's eventually at this place, Wentworth, uh, you have the confluence of the Murray River with the Darling River. And the Darling River has an Aboriginal name and this has multiple Aboriginal names, but uh, sometimes in the southern part of the Darling or the lower Darling, uh, it's called the Barker. Uh, and it's named after Barker, after the Barkindji people. Uh, okay, and they are in this, uh, this area here, uh, uh, when I'm highlighting here, around Volcania and um, west and south of Volcania. Okay, so that's the geography. The northern basin has somewhat of a different hydrology than the southern basin. So the northern basin gets uh, infrequent um, flooding events that are typically associated uh, with cyclonic events where we get cyclones coming in from the Tasman and from the Pacific uh, and coming in and uh, dumping a lot of rainfall here uh, that eventually flows down the system uh, to get flows ultimately in the, in the Darling River. And you can see there are multiple catchments and you can see that the irrigation in the northern part of the basin, you can see it takes place on these upper catchments, okay? 
There are some dams up there as well, but a lot of the irrigation that takes place is uh, from the run of the river. So what that means is, is that uh, irrigators will put pipes in the streams and the rivers, or they use levees to prevent water flowing off their property. And then they pump it into their own uh, storage facilities, which are dams, obviously, and then use that to irrigate the, their crops. Uh, that's different in the Southern Basin, where a lot of it is done through developed irrigation districts, where you are part of the district where you would actually have shared uh, infrastructure. So that's pretty much um, the North, that's pretty much the South. And I'm gonna highlight two locations where we do uh, our, our, our work. So the first location I've just highlighted in green is this on this river <coughs> called the Paru. It is the furthest Western river in the Murray-Darling Basin and is also the most pristine. Okay, it's, uh, so uh, what I mean by pristine, it, uh, there's virtually no water extractions pretty much for any purpose, um, certainly not for irrigation. It's apparently less than 1 billion liters a year is, is extracted from the Peru. So it's pretty much as it was um, you know, in the past. And uh, there is an alternative um, a catchment that we're going to look at and I'm going to highlight it next and it's in red and that's the Lower Darling and so the Lower Darling catchment although there isn't uh, very little <coughs> irrigation around the <coughs> excuse me <coughs> in the Lower Darling itself there's a great deal of irrigation uh, upstream <coughs> uh, in the various catchments on the Balon and the Barwon uh, in particular, uh, but there are other catchments. And so uh, they, that irrigation has a big implication for the stream flows um, in Wilcannia. And so the purpose, uh, the why, so to speak, in terms of uh, my presentation today, is to make a comparison between the Peru, which has very little water extractions, and uh, <clears throat> the Lower Darling, which has a great deal of water extractions, at least upstream and to look at the issues of stream flows and look at the issues of resilience in relation to water bird abundance. And then eventually to come to some conclusions about what uh, human activity is doing uh, in those two uh, different catchments and the implications for how we manage water security pathways to, 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 to water security, so to speak. So that's a, by way of a long introduction, but I think it's important to give you a sense of the geography a sense of where the rivers are going and uh, what I'm trying to do. <laughs> okay. okay, so uh, one of the things that it's helpful, although this is now <clears throat> almost a decade old, this, this figure, what this figure tries to do for, for people who aren't familiar with the Murray-Darling Basin is to give them some sense of how important extractions are in terms of stream flows from the basin as a whole. You'll see it shortly in terms of the, uh, the Lower Darling. So the very first figure, we've got uh, uh, an historical climate. So this is modeled, okay? These are model results uh, with irrigation. So that's the sort of thing business as usual, if you want to call it. And so we have extractions representing, a, 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 my view, a high, a high proportion of, of the inflows. And more importantly, for what this diagram is attempting to do is to show the implications for end of system flows. In this case, it's the Murray mouth. And so you can see that the extractions have a very large impact on the uh, end of system flows, okay? So, so the very top is with irrigation, the bottom is with no irrigation. And so these are both model outputs, but you can see that uh, there's a very large increase, uh, decrease in, in end of system flows. In this case, it's, you know, it's about uh, 76, it depends, this is on an, an average, uh, but you know, it's 70 odd percent reduction uh, of end of system flows. So it's big, it, it's, uh, the, the point about it is water extractions are almost exclusively for, at least in terms of consumption, water consumption, uh, it, it's for irrigation. So it, it's a big deal. So let's uh, go from the, the basin scale, which is a big, big scale, and, and let's drop it down to these uh, two catchments, which are themselves reasonably large, but let's focus in on the Peru River, which I showed you that pristine river, which has virtually no extractions. And then let's focus in on the Lower Darling. And the Lower Darling, I said it has the name, the Barca by the Barkindji people. So I will sometimes use the term uh, the Barca Darling, but it is the Lower, lower Darling. <clears throat> 
And the location we're going to focus in on is at Wilcannia. So Wilcannia is a town of about 400 people. It's right on the, uh, the, the banks of the, of the Lower Darling or the Barker Darling. And that's where the gauges that we, we used in terms of the, the our analysis. So let's just have a, a quick look at this and uh, we'll then get on to the issues of climate change or long weather trends. And so these are model results um, that we've updated but uh, were developed by the Murray-Darling Basin Authority some years ago. And so it's a lot to put into one table, but let's just go through it. So you've got two locations. Well, can you remember that's the Lower D Darling River? You saw it in the map that I provided to you uh, earlier. And here's the Peru. There's a particular gauge along the uh, Peru River. And so we've got uh, two sets of information. And the first set of information is the annual water extractions. So without irrigation, there are of course no extractions. So it's virtually nothing. This is a model result. Okay, so there's, there's no extractions, then we get no irrigation. There's virtually no extractions. That's the importance of irrigation. That's what that shows. And then we look at the baseline extractions, which are based on actual extractions. And you can see the extractions are large, um, are certainly uh, relative to, to the without irrigation uh, context in terms of Wilcannia. Remember the extractions where I'm talking about are upstream. Almost all of that takes place upstream of Wilcannia. And of course the, uh, the Peru River is pristine. So there's, there's no extractions even in the baseline case. And then the implication and what's important in my presentation to you today is to look at the stream flow. So if you look at the stream flow without irrigation, it's approximately 2,500 gigaliters or 2,500 billion liters on average. And remember, this is an average, it's a highly variable system. So it, it could be much more and much, much less. Um, so at some, 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 some times in some years, um, there is no flow. Um, there's actually zero flow at Volcania. Uh, that certainly happened in, in, in 2019, for example. And, and then you can see uh, for the Peru, and then you can see with extractions, you can see there's a huge drop, uh, at least at Volcania. And the, uh, it represents, let's say half or 46% reduction. So basically water extractions for irrigation are accounted for almost half of the reduction in stream flows. So this is a well-known result. It's not something that's particularly surprised to anyone who, who is familiar with the Murray-Darling Basin, but it's, it's just worth highlighting again in that previous figure I showed you for the basin as a whole, how important water extractions are. And of course, then it leads to the, well, what's going on in, in recent trends and what does this mean in terms of how do we respond in terms of if we have some goals in relation to water security. So let's, let, me, let me go on a little further. And now let me bring in the, the biophysical dimensions uh, because as I highlighted in the last couple of days, as you'll be very familiar with the RPCC assessments that just came out, um, uh, six assessments. So look, look at the uh, temperature. So it will be no surprise to you that uh, we have an increasing temperature uh, in the uh, northern part of the Murray-Darling Basin. So this is based on multiple gauges. And so that uh, temperature has gone up. It is statistically significant, highly statistically significant. And it's running now at, um, uh, if you take the entire series, it's, it, it's been increasing at 0.18 centigrade um, increase per decade. And if you take the more recent period, it's increasing at 0.26 degrees centigrade uh, per decade. So that's a, that's a substantial uh, rise um, and continuing to rise. So it's no question getting hotter in the Northern Murray-Darling Basin, no question about that. Uh, what is a, a debate uh, is this issue of the implications of long-term trends in precipitation. So let's go from temperature now into precipitation. There's no clear trend, at least if you take the entire period, and in fact, if you take the entire period, there's actually a slight increase in, in, in trend in precipitation, which again is not surprising from what we'd find in climate change models. But what we've seen more recently is that there's been a decrease, a very a relatively small decrease in precipitation, but nevertheless, there's a trend decrease in, in precipitation in the most recent years, in the most 20, last 20 years. So, so there's a slight decrease in precipitation. And then if you go to pan evaporation, 
So that's how how the, the the water demand, so to speak, from the from the uh, uh, it's really important to, to know what that is and what's how's that changing. Again, um, hard to see a, a trend there, but there does appear to be a slight increase in pan evaporation uh, in the last uh, last few years. It's hard to find trends with these highly variable. <laughs> you can see how variable this is extremely variable and it depends on the scale, but you can see it particularly in precipitation. So it is hard to find trend, but there does appear to be some trend in the last 20 years, a slight increase in pan evaporation. And then there's a measure that's used of dryness, uh, which is uh, pan evaporation over precipitation. And there does appear to be a slight increase uh, in the, uh, the last uh, 20 years. So, so some uncertainty around that. Quentin, just to give you some sense of the timing, we're at, we're at about uh, 30 minutes now. So just, just to so let So I should finish up? Okay, no, not, no, not at oh. all. You need, you need to get to the, the crux, get but to just the to give you okay, a sense so of that. It won't take you long. So, so what we've done is that those two locations, um, and these are two stream gauge locations, one at Karawaru and the other one at Volcania, you can see that over the last uh, 40 years, and certainly in the last 20 years relative to the previous 20 years, you see a reduction in stream flow trends, and you see a reduction in stream flow plans at Peru, and also in the Peru, and also at uh, Volcania, but a bigger, a bigger reduction uh, in Volcania. Remember, these are catchments that are adjacent to each other. So the question that, that, that arises is, well, you know, what's responsible for the reduction in stream flow trends over the last 40 years? How much is attributable to climate change or well, long-term weather trends? How much is attributable to um, other activities, which is as in human activity? And so there's ways to measure that. And there's um, hundreds of papers, I think, or uh, certainly many dozens that use what's called the Boudicca equation. And a Chinese researcher independently called Fu also used this equation as well to basically separate out what the implications are the long term in terms of changes of precipitation and evaporation have on runoff or stream flow and how we're measuring in this catchment. And so by doing that, you're able to determine what is the long term trend in dryness uh, and the implications on stream flow. And uh, what you can't explain with the booty co-equation is that uh, part that uh, you would think is, is nothing to do with the, the, um, the climate, it's, it's more to do with the actual um, uh, anthropogenic activities. So what we find in the Peru, which again does have very little water extractions, we, what we find is observed climate impacts, okay, from our analysis, this is this distribution based around uh, per parameter what we, what we use. And you can see that there's a reduction, as I pointed out, but that reduction is entirely consistent with the long-term trends. There's no, nothing really needs explaining except there are long-term trends in dryness. However, when we look at the uh, lower darling at Volcania, um, we get a, a reduction, yes, associated with this increasing dryness, uh, but what we observe is much, much more than that. So something else is going on other than um, the weather or long-term weather trends or climate change, something else is happening. That something else has to be human activity. Uh, if you want to, if you accept this analysis, then it, 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 if it's not the weather, then it's, it's or the climate, then it's got to be something different. And in this case, it's, it's human activity. And so then it gets us to, to the issue. I'm just gonna quickly jump to this point is to say, well, what is affecting stream flows? And we're saying that in the lower darling, that the big impact uh, is yes, about half of that appears to be climate change or long-term weather trends, but about half of it's unexplained. And we would uh, suggest that the half of that, uh, that other half is, is, is to do with water extractions that are not being properly uh, attributed in terms of what's happening within the basin and certainly the lower darling. So what we've done is, is combine that information, stream flow data, observed stream flow data, and then combined it with aerial surveys about water bird abundance over many years. And there we've done it over here in the Peru, and we've done it here uh, near Wall Canyon, a place called Menindi Lakes. And so we've got abundance measures over years, we've got observed stream flow measures over years, and we've done a, a, a range of um, analyses um, um, uh, which were with distributed lags uh, to be able to, to get a reduced form that looks at water boot abundance as a function of lagged and current stream flow. Uh, 
We've got a series of estimates. I won't go to that with you, but there's a series of estimates for the Peru. There's a series of estimates for the Menendee Lakes. And then the summary of those results are presented here. And you can see that uh, the models suggest that there is an important impact in terms of the lags of bird abundance on current abundance. And there's also an impact in terms of stream flow, both local uh, current and, and lagged stream flow at this location at Menindee Lakes on the Lower Darling, but uh, no, nothing in the, in the context of the Peru. And so we can take those numbers, those estimates, and then we can do some simulations in what we would call model droughts to see the impacts of different stream flow regimes associated with, let's say, in water reallocation. But before we do that, what we've done is to look at, and there's model droughts, the implications for resilience. And so we have that, if you recall the, that figure I provided at the beginning, you've got some measure of the system performance, okay? That's the pre-drought level that we've modeled. And then you have a drought occurring, and we have different years, one-year drought, a two-year drought, or a three-year drought. And you can see the implications in the Peru. Yes, there's a decline in system performance, but in terms of resistance and recovery time, it gets back pretty quickly and it doesn't drop very much. If you look at the Menendi Lakes, there's a big drop relative to Peru. In fact, a very substantial drop with three-year droughts and it takes longer to get back. So that's what we find based on our, our results. And then we looked at an alternative, which is a, a, a hypothetical uh, scenario where there's water reallocation. So the water that's being extracted upstream of Menendee Lakes and Will Canyon and the Lower Darling uh, is reallocated to stream flows for environmental purposes. And so we looked at the implications of that uh, at Menendee Lakes, and you can see that you can get improved performance and water bird abundance with different scenarios. The, 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 the dark scenario, the worst scenario is no change, business as usual, then a 100 gigaliter, 100 billion liters reallocation, and then a 300 gigaliter reallocation. And you can see the possibilities of increasing water bird abundance, increasing resilience, both recovery time and reducing resistance associated with that reallocation. This is a summary table of that resilience in terms of um, the uh, resistance percentage uh, to change. And you can see it's, a, it's, a, it's a, quite a substantial change. Uh, relative to uh, having um, uh, the water reallocation and a substantial change in, as well, though less in terms of the recovery time. So no reallocation, then a 100 gigaliter allocation, reallocation and 300 giga reallocation. So you see the percentage re drops, uh, reduction drops substantially, uh, as well as the recovery time uh, reduces as well. As that's a summary of the figures. And so the key findings, well, the first one is that uh, we have found that model stream flows uh, and others before us that uh, model stream flows indicate that about half stream flows have reduced by about half because of uh, business as usual water extractions. But there's no impact on the Peru, but a big impact on the Lower Darling. If we take the last 40 years rather than the entire data set, we find that uh, there's increasing dryness and uh, reductions in uh, observed stream flows associated with some long-term trends both the Peru and the Lower Darling. Uh, we find that uh, there are these significant reductions. And then I think importantly, in terms of the so-called smoking gun, we've, uh, we've done the booty co analysis and it uh, indicates to us about half of the reduction in observed stream flows can't be attributable to the climate change or dryness change, change in dryness uh, over that period of time. And we therefore attribute it to human activity and the only human activity that has have any, any substance of substantial nature in the, in the Northern Basin is irrigation. So we attribute it to water extractions uh, that I don't think there is any other thing to, to attribute it to. And then um, we looked at the resilience uh, with water birds at those two locations, finding that the uh, water bird abundance is much more resilient at the Peru, where there are no water extractions compared to the Lower Darling. Uh, at the Menindi Lakes. And we also found that it's possible to improve the resilience, recovery time, and also resistance uh, in a model way um, if we were to reduce the uh, water extractions upstream of Menindi Lakes, uh, which is on the Lower Darling River. So thank you, and my apologies for going a little over time, Ruth. <laughs>
Thanks so much, Quentin. I hope you didn't uh, feel too rushed there. I just thought to get Not at all. Oh, that's fantastic. Thank you very much for your presentation today. And um, I'd like to welcome to the stage both um, Julia and Christian. Um, Julia Talbot Jones, she leads uh, the Freshwater Program at Water Research, and she's also a lecturer at Victoria University. Um, Julia's areas uh, cover ecology, economics, and resource management. And Christian Zammer is here uh, as well today. We're lucky enough to have him from Niwa. He's a, a Niwa hydrologist. Christian is leading the New Zealand um, Water Modelling Framework, which aims to provide uh, an accurate hydrological simulation of New Zealand's um, water across um, landscape and climate. And we've got Susie Greenhull here, who I'll just beam on in from um, Auckland. Um, Susie is a, uh, a resource economist from Manaki Whenua. I'll just grab you there, Susie, if I just bear with me. Mm, gallery view, there we are. There she is, Susie. Yes, she, she's a, a, a resource economist from Manaki Whenua, um, uh, land care research, and uh, Susie's areas uh, cover environmental policy, um, economic instruments, and she's also very much interested in collaborative um, ways to uh, climate, uh, uh, sorry, combat uh, environmental issues. So um, if I could just invite you all to, to speak um, briefly, either to Quentin's presentation or something else that uh, you're working on and that's current for you, that would be great. And you're welcome to move the, the screen around as well if you'd like to see each other. And I don't know who'd like to kick off. Would you like to kick off there, Quentin? Well, if we start with Susie. Mm? Well, start with Susie. With Susie. Susie. All right, I have no problems with that. Well, thanks a lot, Quentin. Um, I think you gave us actually a lot of food for thought and the timing is probably pretty nice for us here in New Zealand where we're considering lim targets and limits. And of course, water is one of those big ones that we need to think about. And, you know, my take home from what you were sort of saying was that, you know, we do really need to think about a precautionary approach around water limit setting, uh, especially if we consider that the dries are going to become more, more frequent. Um, I had an interesting discussion this morning with some folks from the Deep South and uh, talking about the, the, some of the new findings coming out of the Earth observation model and, you know, being a maritime climate and with warming seas, it does appear that we will probably have more intense periods of, of short, sharp storm events, but also longer periods of stable weather, which sort of then leads to drought. And so sort of together, that kind of information starts to make you wonder about, you know, what implication does that have for limit settings and how do we actually take advantage of this new knowledge? Um, I'd also like to sort of, you know, yesterday in talking to another colleague, Nick Craddock Henry, about um, resilience. And, you know, we were sort of saying, you know, what are some of the really big areas that we aren't really looking at? And the one thing that we started to talk about with these cascade effects and, you know, what we've got here is you have these periods of drought and sort of, yes, it has an impact on bird life. It has impact on the economies, but what are sort of the wider impacts? And in conversations with growers, for example, in Hawke's Bay, we do know that, you know, if you have these band days that we cut the water off, you don't actually have a, a loss in this year in terms of, of loss production, but it's about 25% next year. It's about 25% the year after, and there's about 15% the year after that. So these actual impacts are far longer than you actually think. And that then has implications for uh, processing plans, employment demand, et cetera, how that might affect trade flows. So again, if we start thinking about limits that are, that are too lenient, uh, we start to get into, our, into this sort of situation where we sort of start to perpetuate issues as they come through. Um, I guess um, just one other thing I'd, I'd sort of um, like to impart, and this is really starting to think about, well, do we actually really need an, a different approach to policy, especially here in New Zealand? And I go back to some conversations that um, I was part of as a limit setting process in one of the regions. And it was all around, you know, what is the minimum limit, limit that we should have? And it was all about bird life abundance, which ties in quite nicely to this conversation here that Quentin was showing. And the stakeholders were sort of saying, right, well, you know, we understand that you, um, that we've got economic impacts of, of sort of a, a lower, sorry, a, a higher minimum, uh, minimum flow. But are there other what things that we can look at? For example, increased pest control, which is a really big problem here in New Zealand. But interestingly, the response from council was, no, this is a water limit setting process. We don't consider anything outside that, that realm. 
And so perhaps this is a bit of a wake up call that we do actually need to think about the system and the whole system and how do we find interventions in different parts of that system to actually achieve the resilience that we're really after, uh, both economically, but also for our native, um, native wildlife and many other things. So I'll just leave it at that with a few thoughts um, that sparked from Quentin's um, really good presentation on how we should be thinking about these things a little bit differently. Thanks for that, Susie. Um, Christian, would you like to um, say something now? Um, yes, uh, thank you, uh, uh, Quentin, for your presentation. Uh, really interesting. Um, I was wondering, uh, so I don't really have uh, a lot to add to what Susie uh, has, uh, has said, except perhaps that uh, some uh, water allocation process are already thinking about uh, cultural and ecological value as a way to determine uh, the number that is going to be allocated and people are starting to think on how uh, uh, this number is going to have to change uh, within the life of the act, the, the RMA Act uh, that we currently have in place and uh, as well uh, the ever-changing climate. Uh, one thing that I was, uh, uh, that I was wondering uh, if uh, you look at it, Quentin, is uh, how uh, the modeling that you've done could be applied in a system which is never going back to its original state, where climate change is always changing the statu quo uh, every two years or every three years or every five years, uh, if uh, really you can go back and uh, that perhaps uh, we should be more drastic in terms of uh, potential uh, change in uh, allocation regime, especially in Australia, uh, and uh, go hard in order that uh, we can uh, get back some of the value that uh, uh, people are keen of. Yeah, that was the question. That was a question from Quentin. To Quentin. Yeah. Did you catch it? Did <coughs> yes, I did. did Shall it? I respond now? Or, or? Yes, no, please do. Yeah, okay, so um, they're all good points. Um, um, I'll respond first with you, Christian, then go to Susie. Uh, so, so, so the issue, I, I think, uh, is back to front in Australia in many places. So the issue is that um, the focus has been on extractions first and then to determine with the residual, to try to achieve with the residual some particular set of... Um, environmental or, or whatever outcomes they are, are not associated with direct extractions. I think the, the, we have a Water Act in Australia that was uh, put into place in, in the federal parliament in 2007 and it was updated in 2008. And certainly the interpretation of the Royal Commissioner, um, Brett Walker and um, Richard Beasley, his senior counsel, and I'm not a lawyer, okay, was that uh, the priority should be, in fact, for the environment. That's what the legislation says. That's not what's happened. So the way you would do it in terms of your water allocations, you would ensure sufficient water for those uh, mandated requirements in the Water Act. Once those have been achieved, then you allow uh, for water extractions. Um, that would be the, the way to do it, uh, consistent with the law of the land. Uh, but it's, a back, back, it's a quite different to the current system which is having a set of extractions first and then some reduction in those extractions to try to achieve some environmental outcomes, which hasn't been particularly successful. Um, so it's a, it's a different way of, of doing it. And that's what I would suggest is the way to redo it. it, it there's a variety of reasons why that won't happen, but that's what I would propose. The, the second issue is around um, the irreversibilities associated um, with climate change, um, and uh, it's a really important point. Now, we don't have that in our model, but there's a really interesting article that Christian May is probably familiar with, but it just came out a couple of months ago by Tim Peterson and, and, and fellow co-authors, and it was the lead article in science. And what they did, um, I was very distantly connected to the paper, I'm not a co-author, but the, 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 they did work in the northern part of the state of Victoria. so. Um, what they looked at is catchments there uh, associated with droughts and why some catchments runoff doesn't recover. Um, that's not true for all of them, but some of them, about a third, as, as I recall in that paper, never recover uh, from, from droughts. 
And so they've attributed that to changes in the vegetation uh, associated with the drought periods. Uh, so that's, um, that's a pretty, a pretty, I think, a pretty important finding. Obviously, it's to their particular locations, which were they, they, their field sites. But, but it's really an important warning for, for um, the water managers that just because the, you know, we're, the drought's over now, we're back to normal, we'll get the same runoff. Um, the Peterson and, and his colleagues were finding that's not the case. There's been, uh, they've crossed some threshold and uh, we're not getting backed. And the, the runoff is in fact less, um, um, in some cases substantially less. So there's something happened. Uh, they don't fully explain what it is, but they certainly demonstrate very clearly that it has happened. Um, and in Susie's point, we're more related to New Zealand, but, but and more than a direct question, but I, I think it's worth highlighting what she was saying, and I, and I would respond here in the context of the Great Barrier Reef. So Australia uh, is inadequate in terms of its mitigation targets and the mitigation it's doing in terms of CO2 and other greenhouse gas emissions. That's very clear. I think everyone knows that. New Zealanders know that. The, the point about it is in the Great Barrier Reef, of course, uh, rising sea surface temperature is, uh, uh, is causing a whole series of issues. Uh, uh, obviously, the most noticeable one is, is coal bleaching. So the fact is the, the C7 temperature is going to get higher. Uh, that's that's uh, absolutely the case. So what does Australia do apart from mitigation? Well, what is happening uh, on the land is that uh, there are method, means, approaches and, and underway and have been for some time to reduce uh, soil runoff onto the reef. So that do doesn't do anything for sea surface temperature, but the idea behind it is if we reduce the soil runoff, that's a um, that's an, an other challenge to the to the reef. Uh, if we can reduce, take that, uh, mitigate that, reduce that, uh, then we can help the reefs uh, make them more resilient to sea surface temperature change. Um, it, it, um, but anyway, that's the so that's just a, an aside in relation to what Susie just said. Uh, so there may be other mechanisms you can use, uh, but of course, with the sea surface temperature rise in the context of Great Barrier Reef, uh, it doesn't really matter ultimately what you do with soil runoff. Uh, if you get sufficiently high enough sea surface temperature change, uh, the reef is gone. So um, yeah, that there's only only works within a certain certain boundaries. Yeah. Thanks for that, Quentin. Um, Quentin, if you could stop sharing your um, your presentation, we might be able to see you a little bit bigger as well, which would be kind of nice. I'm um, just wondering, Julia, if you'd like to um, to to share it with us now. Sure, I'll keep it really quick because I'm sure people have things to do. But um, I wanted to thank Quentin for his presentation. It's very difficult to dif uh, to disentangle effects. Um, on the environment and what he's tried to do with that paper is disentangle the effects of climate change from um, extraction and those impacts on uh, water bird abundance. Um, two key things that he sort of popped out um, from both his presentation and the subsequent comments. Um, one is the key differences in the political economy aspects in Australia and New Zealand. Um, the motivation for Quentin's paper is um, a clear direction from CSIRO and the Bureau of Meteorology that climate change is the cause of declining water bird abundance and um, degrading environmental systems and it's not extraction. So part of the motivation for this paper in Quentin's case is to try and disentangle those effects. Um, and that's not necessarily the same message we get from our Crown Research Institutes and um, universities and research bodies here. The other thing that I thought was interesting is speaking to the values hierarchy that Quentin talked about just briefly in his comments um, and the fact that the Water Act in Australia prioritises extraction over environmental flows despite the wording um, being, uh, maybe I should say, the way that the policy is interpreted um, prioritises extractions over environmental flows. With the reforms that are being proposed through the Essential Freshwater Package, placing Te Mana o te wai at the centre of that reform package um, actually flips our values hierarchy. So what it should do 
Um, it'll be interesting to see how that turns into, uh, translates into practice, but what it should do is uh, prioritise environment, the needs of the environment, and then it, the needs of people, and then finally the needs of industry. And so the run-on effects for how we design our policies could have quite different implications to what we see in the Australian context. So I'll just leave it there because hopefully there'll be some time for questions, but um, certainly there are some lessons from Australia's um, experience that we could take out to apply to the New Zealand context, um, given that we're in a place of reform. Thanks. Thanks, Julia. Um, Christian, would you like to say anything else or shall we open that up now to the audience and see if there's some questions that uh, can spark off some further conversation around either the presentation or you maybe have questions for Julia or Christian? Yes, Eric. Thank you, Eric. <laughs> Hi, thanks. Well, great stuff. Um, I've understood the Murray Darling to have some kinds of limited trading in water allocations. If I've understood you correctly, they've been taking the environmental flows as the residual and then trading among this fixed amount on irrigation flows. Um, I'd understood also part of the problem. It, is that the problem, or is it more around state-level enforcement where you've got four states that the darn thing runs through and varying commitments to the environmental bo bottom lines that should be underpinning this thing? It's made it difficult, I've understood, to implement an integrated cap-and-trade regimes because you've got all these different state issues. So how much of the problem is that they're defining the tradable units as something kind of disjoint from the bottom line environmental flows so that the environment just winds up being a residual? And how much is it the political economy of states having varying di very differing commitments and being able to beggar the neighbor that's downstream? Thank you for the questions. Um, so that there's sort of three, three ways to respond to that because they're sort of combinations together. So. So the first point is um, the different jurisdictions uh, manage water, govern water in different ways within the basin, and some have been more affected than others. I would highlight that the state of New South Wales um, has been one of the least effective uh, jurisdictions in terms of its management of water, and I can provide a bunch of evidence to support that, and uh, evidence not just my own, but from others as well. And indeed, the most recent piece of evidence is the Murray-Darling Basin Authority, uh, their statement that the Bow and Darling Water Sharing Plan, uh, which was uh, provided from the state of New South Wales to the Murray-Darling Basin Authority, which governs the, the overall um, basin plan, uh, which determines the overall diversions or extractions within the basin by jurisdiction, said it's not in compliance and uh, looked at the uh, actual uh, extractions, uh, which exceed the uh, sustainable diversion limits. So um, that's that's a, an ongoing problem, and that's in, in 2021. Um, and the issues around governance is also important. There was a TV program by the Australian Broadcasting Corporation in July of 2017, and it identified in the Northern Basin, um, further upstream of the, the, the Volcania where I was presenting to you uh, in terms of our, our data, Upstream of that, there are some very large irrigation properties, and they identified that some of those were pumping um, water uh, uh, not in compliance with um, the laws of the new state of New South Wales. And they had uh, compliance officers who had provided that information to the state of New South Wales and had subsequently lost their jobs and that uh, their section had been defunded. Um, so anyway, the, the TV program made this known. Uh, the public were outraged. There were five inquiries and eventually things have improved, uh, but that was around compliance in 2017. And indeed in the last few days, uh, two prominent irrigators, and I say prominent, that means they're very wealthy irrigators with a lot of influence in the state of New South Wales and indeed in Australia. They lost their appeal to the Supreme Court of New South Wales uh, for the finding that they were guilty of uh, water theft. Uh, which was identified in the 2017 TV program. So, so the bottom line is there's regulatory capture, there's various uh, people who've, who've turned a blind eye for a variety of reasons. That, that has happened in, in Australia and is part of the problem. 
but the relative amounts associated with water theft are relatively small, although they're, they're big and that shouldn't happen. They're relatively small relative to the sorts of numbers I was presenting to you. So there's something else going on and the big something else is what's called flood plain harvesting. So when there's flood events, which happen occasionally in the Northern Basin, what is, uh, what is happening is that uh, the, the irrigators are capturing it with levees. So the water doesn't flow into the streams, or if it flows in the streams, they have a way of diverting it onto their own properties. Um, this is a, a major problem. It, it, uh, they've got uh, storages, on-farm storages of around 1,500 billion liters. Uh, so it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, big, a, big, a big issue and it has a big implication. And we think that's what's probably going on in the context of uh, uh, stream flows uh, in, in terms of our work. Um, but the, the, the other issue is, is around um, the actual numbers associated with uh, environmental flows. So those are flows that have been designated for the environment and they're through uh, increased levels of stream flow that would not otherwise happen. And the way that uh, has, has occurred in the uh, Murray-Darling Basin is that they, uh, there were baseline diversion limits that were set um, somewhere in the order of um, <clears throat> over 10,000 well, anyway, that, 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 that sustainable diversion limits was somewhere of the order of over 10,000 billion liters a, a year. They had baseline diversion limits higher than that. And the difference between those two, they, they, um, uh, the federal government and the, uh, the individual state governments sought to make that difference uh, through purchasing water entitlements or water rights, and then allocating it to what's called a Commonwealth environmental water holder. So there are substantial amounts of water rights held by this Commonwealth environmental water holder, and that water holder does release water to increase stream flows for environmental purposes. Nevertheless, there is a great debate in Australia about the size of their holdings. In my view, uh, and again, there's a lots of evidence to support this, not just by myself, uh, that indicates that it uh, insufficient uh, 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 holdings and in, therefore insufficient stream flows and therefore inadequate environmental outcomes. And uh, Brett Walker, the Royal Commissioner, also said that's inconsistent with the um, uh, the law of the land in terms of the Water Act of uh, the Federal Water Act of 2007 and its updated Act in 2008. So um, yeah, that's that's another that's another story, uh, another on, ongoing story in, in the Murray Darling Basin. Thank you, Quentin. I'm just wondering, Susie, do you have any comment on that in the New Zealand context, potentially? Yeah, I actually think Quentin um, brought up something that could actually become an issue in New Zealand, but hasn't yet. It's around the floodplain harvesting. Um, one of the issues, you know, of course, one of the responses um, the economic sectors have to, to drought is, is more dams, and they're becoming increasingly challenging to get in place. And so you'll see in a lot of places where they're starting to talk about on-farm storage in lieu of, of these massive dams. And on-farm on, on storage is basically akin to you take the water as it flows through, throws, flows through your property. So I think it's just highlights that we do need to think about potential unintended consequences of um, favouring one approach over another, because I don't think anybody's really talked about what would be the, the consequence of, of lots of on-farm storage on river flows akin to what's happening in Queensland. I'm assuming they're Queensland properties. I'm smiling because I know which ones you're talking about. Thank yeah, you. so just to follow up about what Susie's saying, so there's licensing for floodplain harvesting. So, but uh, there's, a, again, I'm not a lawyer, but there's questions that the uh, people have been in breach of their licenses. Um, uh, and that's, this is not ancient history, we're talking, talking right now, the last couple of years. So it really is a, a major problem, uh, particularly so in the, um, in the basin, it's a very flat area. So um, you don't have to build very big levees. <laughs> you know, a couple of meters high is all you need to trap a lot of water. And, um, and this, is a, this is, as I said, a major problem. And of course, it's a high temperature area in the summer. And so, you know, a large uh, surface area, low, uh, uh, low depth, it just, you know, lots of evaporation. Um, and of course, that's, that's, that's a problem, of course. Um, and so yeah, there's a whole set of issues around it. it, it to me, it's a, it's a really, it's a, it's a big issue right now in New South Wales. Um, it's, I wish we had managed it better. Uh, we haven't, and it, it still hasn't been resolved.
Thank you. Question, um, another question from our audience. Thank you, Quentin. Uh, Mike Jebson here. Uh, my question is related to uh, your the first people of Australia. Um, in New Zealand, you know, there is a very, very active conversation around uh, the indigenous rights and interests in relation to water. What is the state of the conversation in Australia at the moment in relation to that issue? Okay, I, I didn't hear that very you very well. Um, I I think you were referring to uh, the First Peoples of Australia. Is that was that right or Indeed. not? Indeed, yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, it, it's uh, uh, there's a great injustice uh, for the First Peoples of Australia. So uh, there are a number of ways of measuring control or influence over land, a surface area, but uh, the, uh, the First Peoples of Australia represent about, or have control of some sort or other, a little over half of the surface area, the land area of Australia, uh, but they have less than 1% of the water rights. And so uh, this is an historical injustice. So the way it works is that um, uh, in the, uh, towards the end of the, uh, the, end of the, the, the 19th century, the states uh, changed the nature of the property rights and they acquired the right to water, which was presume, uh, previously in the colonial governments, a riparian right. So they acquired all of those rights as statutory rights. Um, that's, they did it through, through their state parliaments. And then, um, then they allocated those statutory rights that held, held, held by, the, uh, by, the, by the state as licenses to irrigators. And uh, it was done on the basis of irrigation infrastructure. So how much land you had and with irrigation infrastructure, you got a certain allocation. And so uh, the first peoples of Australia got Zippo, uh, Zip, nothing uh, uh, to that, that system. And then we moved to a series of, uh, of um, uh, from licenses to water rights, essentially starting in the 1980s and then much more so in the, in the, in the 1990s. And so they converted the water licenses that were only allocated essentially to irrigators, converted them into tradable property rights, uh, water entitlements. And guess what? Because they were based on the water licenses, the First Peoples of Australia got essentially Zippo. There's been some recognition of this. Uh, and so there's a $40 million fund set up by the federal government uh, now, I think two years ago, uh, um, to. Uh, to provide some 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 support to get those water rights, but forty million dollars is a drop in the ocean because the value of the water rights in the Murray Darling Basin represent about twenty six billion billion uh, that's billion dollars. So forty million dollars will count for nothing in terms of reallocation, and it still hasn't been allocated. Um, so yeah, the, this is a yeah, it's a major issue of injustice. Um, there are. The Barkindji people, for example, recently got a, in the last five years, got a settlement of a substantial amount of land. Uh, I think it was 168,000 square kilometers. So it's a, it's a, it's a larger chunk of Western uh, New South Wales, um, but they got no water. Um, they are the people of the river. They got no water rights. Um, so it's, um, it's an ongoing problem. It's, um, it hasn't gone away. It's not going to go away. Uh, and it's a gross injustice, and uh, yeah, it's, it, it needs to be responded to by all Australians. Um, but uh, I, I'm talking off topic now. But you know, we had a um, a statement from the heart from um, the First Peoples of Australia that was sent to the federal parliament, and was uh, dead on arrival by the prime minister at the time. Um, and that was about uh, taking a journey with the First Peoples to respond to these injustices. And uh, so, until and unless we have um, a response, a, a meaningful response to the, um, the statement from the heart until we have the response in terms of this water injustice among other injustices. Um, you know, we've got, um, we've got an ongoing problem here in Australia. Absolutely. So big missed opportunity. Thank you, Quentin. Um, do we have another um, audience question? Up the back there. Thank you. Uh, Neil Deans, uh, Department of Conservation. Um, thank you, Quentin. That was very interesting to, as has been pointed out, that you've disentangled the effect of drought from the effect of water abstraction. 
Uh, I'm interested in, in your view, uh, and, and by the way, it's really good to see that um, effectively enhanced flows have achieved benefits to waterbirds, uh, because that's not always something um, that I've heard about anyway, and the, the Murray-Darling has always been delivered by way of new and increased environmental flows. And indeed, there's even been some concern that some of those environmental flows have not been able to be utilised for environmental purposes, but effectively been banked and utilised to, to make money. Now, I don't know if that's true or not, but I don't know if you have any observation as to other information that confirms that the environmental flows have achieved uh, th their objectives environmentally, in other words, improved fish populations or improved harvest of, of, uh, of, of wildlife or whatever it is. We're having trouble hearing, but I, I think the question was around, um, is there evidence that um, the environmental flows that let's say held by the Commonwealth Environmental Water Holder, have they achieved uh, environmental benefits? And the answer is yes. So um, those benefits are in particular locations where they've directed the, the flows and there are improvements both in terms of vegetation, uh, fish and also bird life. But let me point out the, the basin is, you know, well over a million square kilometers. So um, when, you, um, when you don't have an adequate quantity of water, which we don't, uh, um, then uh, you, you, uh, the, the expression my colleague John Williams says is like watering the petunias. Um, so in other words, you've got a little bit of water and you can water very, 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 very tiny uh, locations within the basin and you can get uh, benefits. And, and that certainly happened. But we're not getting that at uh, Menindee Lakes. Uh, we've got an, uh, and we're not getting it across the basin. Uh, namely, you're getting an ongoing decline in, in water bird um, uh, abundance. Uh, we had a huge fish kill at Menindee Lakes in the, in the Lower Darling in 2019, at the end of 2018 and early 2019, the Menindee fish kills is what it's called millions of fish died um, that was uh, in part related to uh, a hydrological drought caused by uh, extractions uh, upstream and that was found by an academy of uh, the australian academy of sciences panel um, so yeah so the point about it is yes there are benefits but there are very small and very particular locations and overall the state of the environment and there's evidence again it's not you don't have to take my word for it to support what I'm saying, that uh, overall um, we're getting a decline uh, in environmental um, measures, uh, state of the environment type of measures uh, within the within the basin, despite having a basin plan that was passed in the federal parliament in November of 2012. Uh, so yeah, uh, so um, yeah, it's it's a, to me, in my view, it's a serious state of affairs. Um, and I and others have been saying that, that what we're doing is not good enough. We need to adapt, we need to modify, we need to do better. And uh, the response by some people has been, well, no, that's good enough. And uh, just, uh, just wait a few more years and we'll get the results. Uh, but uh, I, think, I think anyone who's got any credibility would, I think would, I don't want to make any aspersions about people, but, but if you look at the literature, let me just say the literature supports what I'm saying, that we're not getting that. Um, that uh, scale, uh, at a scale level improvement. Thank you. Are there any more questions from the audience or potentially from the panel or any other comments from the panel? Here's another question at the back here. Kia ora, Troy Baisden, uh, Waikato University and Te Punaha Matatini and joining Motu as an affiliate. Bring it up closer, hopefully you can hear me better, good. Um, I think a good, really tricky question to ask, given the report on overseer that just came out in New Zealand, is water quality. Um, for New Zealand, our big environmental impact is often around water quality. So many of the same concepts follow through, and we have to deal with the interaction between climate change and water quality. And irrigation potentially is an adaptation, um, amongst other things, but also an intensification. Um, our main, the report that came out says our main water quality model that's used to understand what leaves soil maybe isn't as good as it should be. And it says that it only models long-term average climate. So maybe it doesn't deal with climate change so well. I won't say too much more about that. You don't 
you, you probably know what you already know, but you may have seen the report for the New Zealand panel, and I think it gives the New Zealand panel a comment to challenge ourselves about how we can connect and integrate these two issues. That may be a good c concluding point. Thank you. I, I can't comment on the on the modeling done in New Zealand. I, I, I don't know uh, enough about it, but 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 certainly the 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 the, the issue of water quality is fundamental. Um, I didn't respond to that, but uh, higher temperatures and lower stream flows, uh, no question that's uh, contributing to really uh, worse water quality. And in fact, in 2019 um, in Volcania, um, you couldn't even, and not only in Volcania, Menindi and other, other towns in the Lower Darling, you couldn't even go for a shower. It, it, there was actually water in the taps, but you wouldn't even go for a shower because um, there was blue-green algae issues and there was really bad skin infections. So people were, were traveling 200 kilometers um, to, to, uh, once a week to get a shower. Um, so, so that was a water quality issue. There are, again, I, I don't know the evidence, but there are certainly assertions that there, the, the motor neuron uh, uh, clusters uh, in some of these locations are associated with blue-green algae. Um, um, uh, I don't know the evidence behind it, but there's certainly assertions of that. Uh, and then the water quality issue, um, certainly for drinking water quality, is an ongoing issue in Australia, and it may be surprised to, to, to you in the audience, but we've been doing work beyond the Murray Island across the entire continent of Australia. And uh, it's a major issue in remote communities. And that's typically groundwater rather than surface water. But uh, depending on the, the water quality uh, guideline measure you want to use, you know, uh, we could have upwards of 200,000 Australians drinking water that no way that you and I would, uh, would drink. Uh, and, and they have to drink it. Um, so there's a this water quality issue is is um, yeah it's it's a it's a really big issue on human health uh, and all sorts of issues uh, as well as uh, you know just on the, you know just on the aesthetics and then the uh, uh, and then of course the implications of water quality in in terms of the uh, the overall environment um, not only with fish kills but but the issue of, of salt in particular in in the Murray Darling Basin um, you know. Uh, Seems to be lost there to me somehow. I'm just wondering, does our New Zealand panel have anything to follow up on that final question before we wrap up, I think? Just in response, I think it was Troy that was speaking, actually. Um, I don't think we can actually separate the two in New Zealand, and that's certainly my belief on the council's behalf that's not the case. I think the trick is um, how do we ensure that we've got robust limits um, that account for the interaction between quality and quantity. And sometimes I think in certain, certain places we haven't done such a good job of that, but it's imperative that both of them are dealt with, not just one. I think, um, I think we might wrap it up there, having lost Benton, um, um, had to thank him off camera, but um, thanks to you all for attending today's event. Um, in a couple of weeks on the 26th of August, we have Susie Kerr and the Mortal Woman uh, speaking around uh, just climate transition. So that will be certainly one um, one to uh, attend. I'd like to thank again our panel, Julia Torbett Jones and Christian Sammet, and of course you, Susie Greenhalgh and Auckland, and Benton with that. Thank you very much for um, coming and presenting to us today and uh, evoking that good conversation around um, this most important issue. Um, so with that, we'll, we'll close it off. You're very welcome to hang around and talk amongst yourselves. We've got the place booked until 2 p.m. Uh, apart from that, thanks again, and look forward to seeing you more back again in another one or two. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you so much. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Bye.